Okay, so I'm going to uh, continue here. <clears throat> I've I've talked about OpenSUSE, but I guess I'll just do it before with various things that would happen while I was using it, but I guess I'll just uh, get into it. I would say that OpenSUSE does the best job of making itself look good. Um, it's got a it's got almost as many packages available to it as um, as Ubuntu does. Um, the only problem I really had with it has a very beautiful in-place upgrade. That's a, but it's a little more complicated to work with than Ubuntu, and it. Um, Again, I, I'm right now. I'm having a problem with the uh, GVC view program in there, <laughs> as evidenced by my OpenSUSE upgrade for dummies presentation that I did, or follow up of it. Um, but for the most part, if it could keep a, a stable underbelly it'll do fairly well. Now the one thing it didn't do, it wasn't able to do, was um, give me a, a, after the place upgrade was done, was allow me to keep my proprietary, it didn't allow me to keep my proprietary video drivers in there. I, I may, have, may have made a mistake and not activated that repository during the upgrade, but I don't think I deactivated it. And I think it was active, it just didn't do it, and, and you know, that's Right there, it's a situation where the distribution is giving too much weight to the to um, to the idea of open source and not enough weight to the user. When really the idea of using open source should be one with functionality, not with words. <laughs> That's another thing I'm going to get into. Um, the next system that I have here is Haiku OS Alpha 2. And I hate to do this, um, but I, I'm not doing again, I'm not I'm not doing any of these things to try to be mean. I'm just letting you know what the state of things are. Like just what's the reality for someone looking for another operating system besides Windows they want to use. Um, and of course in all these Linux distributions, uh, if your app is imported over to Linux where well, you're out of luck. Um, if it doesn't work in Wine, I've already got to that, so that, that covers a lot of people. But um, you know, but still Linux and Unix, they, there, there are a lot of apps out there that you can use in these environments that that may suit you well, or you know, certainly going to uh, suit a very large, you know, or a significant portion of the population. But I don't, I don't know about significant percentage, but significant portion indeed. Um, I'm just going to talk about just the state that Haiku is in right now. It's not meant to be a criticism. I'm not saying any of this. Um, I'm not saying this to come across as, well, you should have, you should be doing this now, or you should, you know, I, I completely understand that they're making from scratch an operating system and re-implementing an operating system it's not an easy task so I completely understand that I'm just saying these are the problems that an end user would come across if they try to use it and yes I understand this is alpha this is just where it's at out of all your menu choices this is the state haiku is in that's all I'm saying it's an, I'm trying to be as honest as I can and by the way they've done a beautiful job um, of re-implementing the look and feel of what BEOS was. Um, I think that they've probably done a, probably a fantastic job with the B file system to, to re-implement re it down to the smallest specification. One of which is not having the ability to do uh, soft links, which is a problem if you're trying to use package source or to get all these Unix apps to port over to it, and I've said this before, and I'll say it again: that if um, if the if in Haiku Land they did everything they could to to, um, to allow all these Unix apps to run in it fairly easily, or or at least to be able to compile from something like Package Source, 
I think it would be a very strong contender, and, and they had a good package management system with pre-compiled packages out there, which I know that's their intent, by the way. Um, it would be a very, very good alternative choice for Linux on the desktop, and probably a better one. There would be a lot less problems to deal with, including permissions and the file systems tab, <laughs> you know, fiddling with all that. Um, it, there's, there, there's some things Haiku is just stronger than Linux is just to start with. Um, you just you boot into it and it can see all the partitions and you can mount them easily. You just right click on the desktop and you select mount and you pick it. And it has riser file system support and it has EXT support and it has NTFS support. And Alpha 2, which is very impressive. Okay, but I'm also going to mention things that don't work if, in case you're thinking of using it. <clears throat> it doesn't have a lot of apps right now. And one reason, I believe one reason is because, um, for example, Firefox um, or Wine, or thing, you know, those apps, they all, they all need some basic things that don't really... They, they all no, no, basically um, they all need hard link. You know, having a soft link in the file system is a kind of like a basic thing that a lot of apps need. Uh, apps were built depending upon that the file system having that ability. It isn't there. Um, in some cases, when I try to compile Wine, you, I couldn't compile it because it didn't have support for X11. Well, that's not really you know Wine's in that case. I think Wine really should add that capability to not have to need an X11 library. Okay, um, should be tweaked for that. That's understandable because honestly, um, I, I've, I've installed Haiku on. A Pentium 3 and now a brand new machine in both cases with two dramatically different cards and, and CRTs or flat, flat from one CRT and one flat screen in each case it was able to configure the graphic user interface perfectly and easily without any problem. Um, that's another strength. Now weaknesses right now, the network networking support is weak right now. Um, you can't print any printers on the network right now. Um, and of course all the apps are just <laughs> they're not there. Okay, now I'll go to Fedora 15. And Fedora, the the, <clears throat> the taste I've always had in my mouth for Fedora is they 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 go a little they go far too far overboard. They'll always pick um, they have a decision to make. They're, they, they usually always make a choice in favor of uh, what the Free Software Foundation desires the end result to be rather than usability. Or the idea of not having anything bloated. So for example, when I went to Fedora 15, it didn't have Firefox installed. Now granted, I had downloaded from their site just the KDE CD version. Um, you know, the whole installation could have fit on a CD. You know, I mean, fitting Firefox on a something that could be installed from a CD. Well, I'm not surprised it's not there actually. You know, now once I got in there, um, I was really boggled to know a few things. I was really I, I didn't know. First question I had was, how do you install apps in this thing? And it took me a while to figure out that I actually had to go into the KDE control center, and then there was activated. Um, there was a, an option in there that isn't in um, at least the Slackware's version of the KDE control center for software installations, managing your software that way. Now, once I found it, and um, it, it presented itself very much like the Ubuntu software center. Although it was a little, you know, you had to search for the name of the app you actually want to install. It doesn't really give you a list of apps, and then you can, oh, I, oh, I have, I can install that. That's not really an option. Same thing with the Ubuntu Software Center. It's more like you have to know what you want first, and so you kind of, you're kind of, 
you're left out a little bit. You, there may be some surprises in there you don't know about that isn't plainly presented. But um, as far as the package managing itself, it, it beautifully downloaded the uh, packages to install and installed them without issue. The upgrade went nice and smooth. And I should mention Linux Mint's upgrade went nice and smooth. Um, and it didn't log. It didn't. It didn't have um, a restricted. Uh, it didn't restrict my login to KDE when I wanted to log in there as root. In fact, I've done it numerous times. That that's good. I found, and this is just not much. The the, the look of it was just a little. I mean, the desktop artwork on its own looked okay but just a little odd yeah, it looked good in some ways you know um, the way gnome is laid out to kind of move around from one file to the other I I didn't really like it it you know every time you go to a new directory it opens up a new window um, SC Linux wasn't as problematic as it was before although there were a few times where a couple of warnings came up about things where I just can't tell whether it's <laughs> whether it's a security problem or not, it may just be a part of the function of the program. I mean, SE Linux is trying to do way too much. It's, it's too big of an environment to try to cover every single function that every program does in there to see whether it's a security risk or not, at least in my opinion. Um, I found that when I was in there as root now, um, I had no problem accessing my other partitions. It was, it was easy. Um, once I had Firefox 4 installed, no problems there. Um, so I think in general it's, it's it's a good distribution. It just looks and feels a little odd, just kind of like Ubuntu looks. A little looks and feels a little bit odd. I'd say Linux Mint has a little bit of a, an advantage there. Um, the one thing it doesn't do is auto log the user in. Now, I again, there may have been a an option during the install. Now, I could guarantee Fedora. I didn't even try, but I can guarantee Fedora did not ship with Java or Flash in there to start with. Um, Mandriva also doesn't log the Mandriva 10 also doesn't log the user in automatically. You can't log into root. Log into KDE is root. Um, I still don't really know how to get to the package management. I found the look of it just way too cartoonish. Um, you know, but it's no big deal. I've talked about Slackware a lot here. Um, Slackware really does well with elegance. I mean, in a lot of ways. And, um, I'm not going to complain at all about Slackware using an, you know, a NCurses based or, you know, what Windows users would call it, a DOS GUI kind of um, command line to do the install. Like, you know, it doesn't matter. I, I found that it was, to do an upgrade, it was a little tedious to have to uninstall all the apps there, although it wasn't required. <coughs> now, one thing that, that did happen is, um, is I had my camera plugged in when I did the install, <coughs> so it, did, it actually picked my USB uh, uh, microphone as the default um, audio device. Okay, I had to make a change in, um, uh, I forgot the setting, I had to make a change uh, I think it was in the mod probe, mod probe D, and I had to make a file called sound, and I had to earmark my uh, my USB uh, audio device as not being device zero, but one with the entry index one, and then and then it, then I was able to actually uh, get full features out of my sound. So what what ended up happening is is I I go into into Slackware. And of course, it doesn't. As I discussed earlier, it doesn't. You have to. You have to activate it to boot into uh, 
uh, run level four, so X comes right up. So I had to do the start X. I also found that it was a bit confusing during the install. I had to actually type setup at the command line after I had removed all the packages. And then it felt like I was going in circles and it had trouble finding the CD. It finally did, and then it finally installed all the packages eventually. But uh, the problem that I had after everything was set up, I'd go into Firefox and try to go to YouTube after I, ha I had installed um, Flash, because Java came with it. Um, there was no sound, and I also enabled WebGL in there, but when I went to the, um, to the run field demo where the fox jumps over those pits, it had no sound. And I was just boggled as to what happened. I went to Alza Mixer and I saw that my USB card was earmarked as device zero. And it really took a long time for me to find someone that happened to, um, to go to a forum and someone linked the person to a post as wild guesses to it might have been a problem and it ended up it was and basically you have to make one change and etc. My probe D make a file called sound and use the name of your your device and you have to on the left and then you have to put index equals one and then I reboot it in and then I had sound in, in Firefox. So Firefox by default uses your default sound device and if you're you know this this Logitech camera doesn't produce sound, it only captures sound, so it was sending sound through my camera, but my camera, of course, can't produce any output, so just, I had a silent browser, but the KDE environment actually did have sounds. I was confused there for a while, and there were, there were a few false positive solutions out there that didn't apply, you know, one included installing some, some sound component that escapes, the name escapes me right now. Also after I just installed, when I tried to go back into package tool, and I don't even know how this fixed itself, I type um, pkgtool, because I like to be able to actually see what, you know, tools are available to install, uh, what packages are available to install and select them, because maybe I, it doesn't come to mind immediately, maybe I forgot about something. Um, it just died in it, and I had some error with the end curses library. Eventually, it resolved itself, after, and even it persisted after I did an update and a reboot. I'm not sure why it did that, but it's working now. Um, so that's it. One thing that was very good about the Slackware distribution is uh, for version 13, uh, the maintainer actually took the effort to um, update KDE 3 uh, to be able to be installed but unsupported in Slackware 13 and kind of set a path for other people to um, keep that the you know the set of packages updated in later versions but they won't um, and so there was two or three people that actually had followed that path and had put the binaries up at one server or the other. Um, there was one server that I saw and I just wondered when I saw the .cc domain name and you know, with my recent experience with malware, um, if I see anything on a .cc domain name, I, I, I always start to wonder if there's a Trojan horse in it. Maybe I'm biased. I don't know. But um, the, the software may be perfectly fine. But anyway, now when I when I was, the, the elegance about Slackware is that you don't have to do much to get something to do what you want it to do. And, it, and Slackware is very good at using tools that are available. Now it was, I had gone through an upgrade. I had uninstalled all the packages, but I didn't format the hard drive. I had to change this, this two Slack package configuration files. I couldn't get it to run immediately. Meanwhile, Mandrake, if you want to install a package, I had to insert the disk in there. Uh, URPMI, I, it wasn't clear to me, I don't know everything about URPMI, but it wasn't clear to me how to get things to install from a remote location. <clears throat> but in, in, in Slackware, you know, Slack package worked fairly well. You know, it's command line based, but it worked fairly well. Um, but the elegance of Slackware is the guy just puts the cups configuration tool in the menu bar and 
That's what ships with cups. He doesn't make another one. <laughs> he lets the, the people that, that make cups give you the graphical user interface. And it worked fairly well. It detected two of my printers almost automatically. Uh, and that brings me to the side point that I mentioned at the beginning of all this, um, that um, we had recently got two HP printers that requires HP lip. And I just, it wasn't until I had upgraded the systems that I actually wanted to print to those printers in did HP lip actually work. Um, I tried to install HP lip in either Fedora or uh, Mandriva 1002 and it just fizzled in one of them. In Ubuntu it works fine, SUSE it works fine, and apparently in Slackware it installs as one of the base packages and works fine because the CUPS web interface that all I had to do is log in as root and supply the password, there was no other issues, um, detected my HP lip printer that was powered on and on the network at the time. I, I went in there and installed the driver almost automatically. It was very good, so you know, it almost makes me wonder why these distributions are actually adding these print managers that change over time and rich, you know, whose you know, who's level of intuit, intuitivity uh, shrinks and uh, gets better with each version. I wonder why they just don't just use the CUPS interface to start with. Um, well, that's my review, but with all these different things, each one of these things present in some cases, there is a problem in one distribution that doesn't exist in the other. And those very problems that the other distributions demonstrate that they're able to avoid um, are problematic or obstacles, um, things that are obstacle, um, really are all things that really actually shouldn't be there uh, if we want to put our best foot forward for more people to adopt the system. It's not like it's QuickBooks that hasn't been ported over to, to Linux. It's more like, you know, <clears throat> now it's a real pain in the butt for me to to add in, to be able to access this other partition over here because I can't log in to the graphical user interface of KDE, you know, or or maybe it's because they can't, you know, the, the they can't change permissions in a window, or or the GOVC viewer isn't working this time, or you know all these things which you would think that you know if it works in this other distribution, why doesn't it work over here? Those are all things that really, hopefully, the set of standards that I laid out, the distributions guarantee that they're going to be able to do. In theory, as a blanket statement, very general statements. Um, Will wipe out all these, you know, inconsistencies where one distribution has an advantage over here, but this one doesn't, but that one does. All these different, but they all have problems in one way or the other. If all those problems could be eliminated, then all we have left is the ob obstacle of the things that are right now not really possible, like having the apps ported over, the commercial apps that we want, like having the stable environment. Once we get past all these difficulties and problems, then we, we can actually move on. And that's, that's basically my suggestion, to adopt a basic set of standards of guaranteed of, a guarantee of functionality, and then also for each distribution to take a good hard look at itself and uh, see where they're strong, stronger against the other ones, see where they're weak, and try to make up for those gaps and, and unify the functionality between all these different distributions. And um, if I had my druthers, I would just, my best suggestion to all these other distributions that don't have as many apps compiled and ready for it is just rearrange your file structure to that of Ubuntu's and adopt the deb thing and be done with it. Wouldn't that be nice? That like Linux Mint's doing. And if you have a safe customization of your menu that won't get corrupted by other packages that come in uh, via Ubuntu, then you're good to go to make customizations. I'm going to end here, and um, I hope, hopefully, I pointed out some things that will eventually be helpful. You know, if the people. Have 
Mandrake heard this video, they you know hopefully next time they ship, they won't disable root logins in KDE. That's why there's a password. We already have you know, don't don't my message is don't don't hamper the user. Let the security mechanism that's in place in the operating system provide the security you think you're providing by putting all these hampers in place. Eliminate the hampers, let the security do its job as being a security mechanism.